afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Set in Education on Friday, May 14th. Uh, hoping to uh, have us uh, finish our work by 3.30 at the latest, uh, given that I know other people, everybody has priorities, other priorities and work to do at that time of year. Uh, so uh, Senator Chittenden, please know, is in a committee of conference for transportation. Uh, otherwise, he would be here. And Senator Perslick is at a graduation. Uh, OK. So committee, we are going to look today at uh, H-426. This is an act relating to addressing the needs and conditions of public schools. The House has uh, approved the bill with further proposal of amendment. Uh, and it should be on our notice calendar. I think, uh, I don't know if we're meeting for a token session on Monday, but it could be up uh, as early as uh, Tuesday. And so we have uh, been working closely with the House. And so I've asked uh, Rebecca Wasserman to take us through the changes. And then after that, we are going to look at the issue of testing for PCBs in schools. Uh, we know that we are, we're, as we'll hear, uh, we'll have an update on radon, what the House did with our work there. We know that there's $5 million in the budget for radon testing. And there's some question out there as to whether or not the language and appropriations is directive as uh, enough uh, to uh, those who'd be responsible for testing to actually test. And then finally, uh, following up on this morning's conversations, uh, we're going to hear from Mark Peralt on uh, small schools grants so that everybody, again, sort of knows what they are. Uh, we know that it passed second reading today, uh, the small schools grant component of the tax bill, but I would still like to be able to get back to Senator uh, Cummings with this committee's either endorsement or not. So with that, Back, uh, Ms. Wasserman, please. Hi, good afternoon, Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Um, so the uh, what I will be going through is the draft 1.3 of the um, further proposal of amendment that came out of House Education for H-426. There are three instances of amendment here. Um, the first two are similar changes, so I'll, I'll talk about those together. Um, in the underlying bill, um, the first instance of amendment is in section three of the, the bill, which um, as a reminder is having AOE do the um, facilities condition inventory and assessment. Um, the language, uh, as passed by the Senate, had AOE doing this in coordination with the Department of Buildings and General Services. And the change in this section is uh, changing coordination to consultation. So AOE will be doing this in consultation with BGS. And it's a similar change in, sec in the second instance of amendment, um, which um, as passed out of your committee, there was added uh, section 10 of the bill, which had AOE and BGS looking at, uh, looking in, in coordination at um, how to use the state energy management program to assist schools with uh, implementing the energy conservation measures that are identified in the facilities conditions in inventory and assessment. Um, and it is just changing that role of BGS to be, um, in consultation, sorry, in coordination to in consultation with. And then, uh, are there any questions on that? Okay. And then the third instance of amendment is in section 12 of the bill. Uh, this came out of your committee um, requiring radon testing in schools. Um, the first change is to the section title, which had the Department of Health in the title, um, and that was removed since uh, this is actually being a requirement on schools and not the Department of Health. Um, subsection A of, of that section was struck out, um, and it, it's just making a few changes, but I, it, it was struck out just because uh, it was confusing to have multiple instances of amendment here, but I'll tell you what the, the changes are. 
Um, the first is that the testing, as came out of the Senate, was required to be done by January of 2023. And this is extended to June 30th, 2023. The requirement for testing um, as came out of the Senate was just for public schools. And this is adding in uh, approved independent schools. So by June 30th of 2023, each public school and approved independent school has to uh, conduct this um, radon testing. And what they also added in um, is that if, if you go to uh, page two of the amendment is that um, if a public school or approved independent school is engaged in implementing an indoor air quality improvement project prior to June 30th, 2023, then those schools get an additional year to do the radon testing. So they would not be required to do it until June 30th, 2024. And then finally in subsection B, of that section, it requires that the public school provide the results of the test to uh, school employees and uh, students. And this is just adding in here approved independent schools since this is uh, now a requirement for both public and schools and approved independent schools. And that's, that's it. Questions, committee? <clears throat> uh, I was pleased, I talked to the chair of House Ed that it was unanimous on the radon, which, uh, which was terrific, 11-0, um, that, was, that was great. Um, okay, Senator Lyons, you're muted. I just wanna make sure that I'm not, um, if you're not, hopefully you're not saying, Brian, why aren't you calling on me? No, I was just saying awesome. Okay. Right. Yeah. Awesome and Brian kind of look the same when you can't. Yeah. And, and Senator <laughs> Terenzini was gesticulating awesome. So good, good, good. That's good news. Good news. Yeah, that is good. Is. So uh, I think we're making some progress. Senator Hooker, anything from you at this point? Just looking at the, um, the dates again. Yeah. Uh, so if a school hasn't has engaged in implementing the indoor air quality to give them time to finish that, um, the projects and then test for radon? Is that the, you know, what is the? Uh... Yeah, I think there was some discussion that it didn't make sense to test for radon before those projects are completed. Oh, um, so they should sort of be done in conjunction with one another. Um, and so that was the reason. Uh, I mean, it, it might be helpful to have someone from Senate from House Ed talk about it, but that was the the it testimony. Would make sense if they're so, limiting something to see what the the effects of the remediation are, and and for other schools that haven't done such, then check the level of radon. Yeah. Except, except it might mean additional remediation, HVAC and remediation beyond what they do. So, chicken and egg question. Mm. Mm -hmm. You mean if they wait, if they're doing the, the HVAC and they find something and then they've got to rework, yeah. Right. I'm just wondering what, whether they talked about that yeah. at all. But I know that when we were talking about radon in institutions last session, you uh -huh. know, one, of the, one of the things that was recommended was, you know, to improve the, the HVAC system. And that's right. apparently took care of the problem in many instances. So I don't know if you can really determine, you know, whether or not the HVAC system as it would be installed would not remediate the problem. I don't know. Well, yeah, no. So it depends on the test results and then they do, they, they do an analysis for what is needed for remediation. And if it's the HVAC system, then, you know, they do it. My question is, if you just go in and fix the HVAC system Without and maybe you exclude one wing of the school for one, that because it's a newer wing or something, and then you find out that you should have done that too. I, I don't know. I, you know, I just think this is a question beyond my ken. Well, we will have, uh, I'm sorry, Senator Hooker, did I interrupt you? Oh, okay. Um, uh, Jeannie, we'll have, uh, 
we'll have Jeannie. Right. What can uh, I do for you? Jeannie, would you uh, have somebody from House Ed come in on Tuesday for uh, a little more information on their amendment? Thank you. Okay. Or preferably, preferably Coopley, right? Like uh, Senator Campion? I would like to see Larry <laughs> Coopley in this committee, either uh, by subpoena or if, <laughs> yeah. if that's... Sorry, not, not needed. He, he can certainly <laughs> happy to have him. You'd probably probably be golfing though by then. So you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, but I think I don't. I, this looks like we're we could be okay. But I think we should hear from the House, and we'll have Jeannie just also Jeannie, if you would put it on for a vote on Tuesday, um, that would be great. And uh, Ms. Wasserman, would you? mind sending it, emailing it directly to Senator Perchlick? Is that uh, this, this amendment? Sure, I can do that. Or, or send it, or actually, no, I'll have, I can have, I'll have Jeannie send it directly to him. I'll uh, do it, I'm happy to okay. do it. Thank you, and I, I apologize for that. And I know the um, official version should be posted shortly. I just heard okay. on the website. So um, hopefully okay. that'll be up soon. Oh, I see it is, it is up. Terrific. Okay. All right. Any other questions for Ms. Wasserman? Uh, okay. Seeing none. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you've been incredible this entire process. So, uh, and I'm sure we'll see you again. Have a good afternoon. Have a, have a good afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we will, uh, it looks like our next witnesses should be here any moment. Uh, we are going to do a walkthrough on uh, issues related to PCBs. So, Jeannie, do you want to reach out to Mike O'Grady? And we'll just, uh, why don't we come back in just a couple minutes? Or we can just all hang here, whatever people want to do. Oh, I'm trying to access uh, Jeannie. Yes, Senator. Uh, they are having difficulty getting into the meeting. The Zoom link was sent. But it's not starting. Can you uh, let our witnesses be in touch with them? They might be trying to join by the old link. I'll remind yeah, you. Them. You would let uh, everybody know. That'd be great. Yeah, I did, but they must not have noticed. Yeah, that. Michael Grady in particular, it looks like, is having some difficulty. Okay. Thanks. It's gorgeous down here. I hope it's as beautiful everywhere else. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know if you were on the Senate floor when I said this morning I had Eric came running downstairs, chickens running around in the backyard like crazy, a fox. Ooh. And then everybody survived. But at the same time, uh, we've been hatching some eggs that were upstairs. And uh, yeah, it's, um, it was. I, I, it was one of those mornings when you thought, you know, is this going to be a <laughs> symptom of the day? And then when I forgot to talk to a probes with the, with the money in the budget, I thought, oh, gosh, here it goes. The whole day. Oh, oh gosh. I know. It's funny, isn't it? Well, everything turned out. Everything's turned out. Yes. And so we have a little gray fox in our yard. Who oh, comes you do? In. Yep. Comes I in love to, fox. They come in to get the cherry tree. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. yeah That's great. They're great. That's They're great. Yeah, yeah. Mr. O'Grady, thanks for joining us. Sorry about the confusion with the link. Um, so committee, uh, we are, um, we've been working for a little bit for a while on again, off again, and talking about uh, PCB testing. And it's brought to my attention a couple of days ago that uh, approach uh, the language in the budget uh, there was some impression that indeed it, it sort of requiring, or at least there was an understanding that schools would be tested, uh, required to be tested. And, but it looks like there, there might be some vagueness there. So uh, what uh, Mr. O'Grady has is some draft language to share with us. But before you do that, I'm wondering, uh, Mr. O'Grady, is there, have you seen the light, had a chance to look at the language in the big bill that is, people are saying is ambiguous? Um, yes, I have. Uh, it is uh, authority, um, well, it's a transfer of $4.5 million to the Environmental Contingency Fund. Yeah. Um, 
and it says the DEC and the Department of Health shall use up to 4.5 million to complete air indoor quality testing for PCBs in public schools and approved and recognized independent schools. It doesn't put the mandate on schools to conduct the testing. So th there isn't that specific mandate, it just directs or actually authorizes DEC to use $4.5 million to do um, indoor air quality testing for PCBs. And it was my understanding that the agency planned to do it on a voluntary basis. So, uh, so saying shall is the shall, and I, I don't have the language in front of me, I apologize. Is it saying that the DEC shall do this? It says that they shall use up to $4.5 million to do okay. the, the indoor air quality testing. And that is, I don't know if you can, in your opinion, if that were to stand, what would happen? I mean, it, it a number of different things are saying they, it, they shall do it doesn't mean that they have to lift a finger or does it mean that they need to reach out? Does it mean that in a year, if they've done nothing, we could come back and say, what's going on? Well, I, I think what will happen is that they will set up a, a, a voluntary program similar to how they set up a voluntary program for testing lead and drinking water okay. before that mandate went into place. And so schools that want to do it, um, well, step back, DEC will likely inform schools and, and organizations that represent schools regarding the availability of, of the testing. And then schools will apply and the agency will likely set up a schedule for conducting the testing. I don't know if they will use all $4.5 million before you return in January. I doubt that they will. Um, so you would have the opportunity to get a status report from them, uh, uh, including how much of that money that they have spent. Okay. Committee, before we go into some language here, center lines. Well, just to, to clarify then, uh, who, who is responsible for reaching out one way one direction or the other for the testing to be initiated. So is it the department reaching out? Who is so it? right now that, the, that is all unclear oh. because the language does not specify any of that. Okay. The detail is not there. You may remember the lead and drinking water and schools bill where the detail was very Undetailed. No, it was very detailed. It was <laughs> there was there was a, yeah. a significant amount of detail about how that was going to be conducted. This does not have that that level of detail. Is that is that? I'm sorry, is, Senator Lyons. I just need to enter one more. Jeannie, uh, is Jeannie there? Just I, I am here, sir, Senator. Jeannie, I'm receiving texts uh, that people can that are not being allowed in. I don't know if you can work on that. that I, I, I am. I'm dealing with that. OK, great. Thank yep. you. You're welcome. OK, sorry, Senator Lyons. Go ahead. No, that's OK. I, I was just asking uh, if the um, the mo if the lead testing language could serve as a model for PCB or is it significantly different? Um, it's 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 the skeleton would be a model, the yeah. flesh on it, because what the agency would require would be uh, um, monitoring for for what's called the screening value for PCB, um, and then then in contrast to the lead and drinking water bill, where you have an exceedance and you you go and you fix the issue with PCB, they do an evaluation of whether or not the exposure uh, 
requires remediation or not. Uh, and um, then they develop a, a control plan or, or a, um, yeah, a screening control plan uh, to, to address the, the exceedance and the level of exceedance. Um, and that, that, that could have a vast array of alternatives under it. Um, so it's not, it's not a, a, a apples to apples issue because you're not dealing with the same type of uh, contaminant and the same type of media in which the contaminant is present or the same type of cause. Because the cause for lead in drinking water was, I believe when all was said and done, over 90% of it was due to just old fixtures. Mm -hmm. We're here, the, the array of building materials that could be the source is, is it's more than just one category of, of material like lead and drinking water. It could be paint, it could be right. caulk, it could be insulation, it could be a, a vast array of, of materials. Okay, thank you. Okay, why don't we, uh, for those of you who are just joining us, apologize for the confusion with the link. Uh, we are working with Mr. O'Grady and I know we'll hear from all of you on situation before us, uh, language that needs clarification in the big bill. Um, and I think that is what we are going to strive to do. Uh, at least that's our goal at the outset of today. We'll see if that changes after hearing from everyone. Mr. Grady, would you mind taking us through uh, the language? Sure. Um, do you have a copy of it, or we have a copy that is under? I believe if it is, we I'm looking at something under uh, the committee assistant put it under Peter Walk's name. Okay. Name, well, which, I, I, uh, uh, which I believe is you know the A is the ANR BDH proposal. Right. I have. Um... I have called up on my screen uh, basically the same language. It's just formatted in in legislative format. So I'll call that up and put That's it That's right. You don't screen. need to call it up. You know, we usually just work right from our iPads. As long okay, as it's sure. the same, we'll just stick with this. Thanks. Okay. Um, so uh, what you have in front of you is uh, the agency's proposal for fleshing out the $4.5 million that is in the big bill. And the first thing that it does, well, let me step back. Generally, what this would do is it would require all schools, public, independent, and recognized schools that were constructed or renovated before 1980 to conduct screening level investigations of indoor air for the presence of PCBs. And once or if PCBs were discovered in excess of the screening levels, there would be an evaluation. There would be, well, first there'd be a report about the source of the PCBs. There would be an evaluation of that report and the potential exposure of students and other people within the school building to the PCBs and, um, recommended measures that the school could take to address the potential exposures. So that's generally what the bill does. Um, the first thing the bill does specifically is it amends um, two sections to change the definition of release um, related to hazardous materials. Section one is an amendment to the environmental contingency fund language um, in 10 VSA 1283. The environmental contingency fund um, is a special fund uh, that the agency administers, uh, which authorizes disbursements um, to A&R so they can undertake actions necessary to investigate or mitigate um, hazardous materials releases. So the $4.5 million that's in the appropriations bill, it's authorized to be taken out of the environmental contingency fund. So this is an important definition for the purpose of clarifying the use of 
the environmental contingency fund for this monitoring. And what the change is, it defines a release to also mean um, the intentional or unintentional action or emission resulting in a spill, leak, or emission of PCBs from building materials in a building or structure. So now with this change, it's very clear that ANR has authority to use the Environmental Contingency Fund for the purpose of responding to a release of that kind. Similar change is made in 10 VSA 602. Those are the definitions for the solid waste and hazardous waste chapter in law. ANR has authority under that chapter uh, to take action to require persons responsible for hazardous materials release to respond and remediate to that and remediate that release and potentially to be liable and pay for that release. So that same definition of release that I just walked you through for the Environmental Contingency Fund is added to the Solid Waste and Hazardous Waste Chapter in 10 BSA. And then you come to section three of the language, which is session law. And this is the directive uh, for the testing. Um, it, it, the first thing it does is it clarifies that what the standard is going to be and the, and the for, for the monitoring. And ANR has a rule uh, called the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation's Investigation and Remediation of Contaminated Properties Rule. Now, what that rule does, it provides procedures and requirements for conducting investigations and corrective actions of property where a release of hazardous materials occur. So basically that's the standard that, that the testing will be, will be conducted under, that, that A&R rule um, for contaminated properties. And that's what subsection A of section three does. And then there's subsection B, which is the mandate that on or before August 1st, 2026, all schools that were constructed or renovated before 1980 shall conduct a screening level investigation of indoor air in their school districts, supervisory unions, and independent schools of school buildings for PCBs according to the guidelines adopted by DEC in consultation with the Department of Health. So there's the mandate. On or before August 2026, they do the screening level investigation for PCBs in those buildings constructed before 1980. The school district, school, et cetera, that has a sampling result that exceeds 15 nanograms per cubic meter shall conduct a site investigation in, in accordance with DEC's rule, that rule I just told, told you about their contaminated properties rule, to determine where the source of the PCB contamination is located. The site investigation report shall include uh, the school, its source area, the use of the location, uh, the number of students and teachers occupying that location daily and the length of time that they are present. Then in, under subsection D, based on that site investigation report, the Department of Health shall provide the school with guidance on the potential health effects and the guidance shall be used by the Department of Health. Um, the guidance provided by the Department of Health shall be used to evaluate cleanup alternatives and shall be used by DEC to determine whether the school has met the requirements for site closure under subchapter 10 of that contaminated properties rule. I wanna be clear, site closure is a term of art underneath that rule. It does not mean closing the building, right? And that, that might be a confusion that people will like, oh my God, it says site closure. It means the school building. Site closure means that you have met the standard underneath the contaminated rule to stop the investigation and response. That's what a site closure is. You're no longer a site that has an issue. So that's, that's what that refers to. It's not about closing the school. Now, the school might need to be closed depending on what the PCB levels are that are determined in the screening level investigation, but that's, you have to, first do the test, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to be clear, site closure Got doesn't it. mandate the building is closed. Got it. Um, 
And then the last part of the language that you received from the commissioner, I believe the version that you received is X'd out. It's the um, authorization of positions because those positions are already in the budget. Um, they are in uh, section E100 subsection A4 and they create two five-year limited service classified positions, one at DEC and one at the Department of Health. Okay, thank you. There is one other appropriation in H439. There's the 4.5 that I talked to you about from the Environmental Contingency Fund. There's another $500,000 in one-time money to be used for the same purpose of PCB um, testing in schools. Committee, any questions for Mr. O'Grady before we walk through this uh, <clears throat> or hear from the uh, commissioner and his team? I, I'm very pleased that we do have a quorum from the Health and Welfare Committee, uh, given that this is uh, certainly within their jurisdiction and it would be great to partner and move forward on this. Um, okay, so I think uh, this will be covered by uh, Commissioner Walk, but 2026 seems like an awful long time uh, to wait to get to everybody. So with that, uh, Mr. Walk, uh, the floor is yours and uh, your teams. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, Peter Walk, Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation. I'm joined today by ANR General Counsel, Matt Chapman, and the, the manager of the Sites Management Section uh, Trish Coppolino. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I did want to provide a, a, a little bit of clarity before we get going on sort of the nature of the development of this proposal. Um, when we, uh, when, when it was clear that there was, there were going to be some, some one-time revenue available to allocate to different purposes, we advocated for and the governor proposed to set aside this $5 million for the testing of, of schools for PCBs. That we in, intentionally left that as a voluntary program, not because we thought that a voluntary program was ultimately appropriate, but because we knew that there would be a desire for and a need for additional discussion by your committee and others. Um, and so the language that you see before you was a, a, at the request of, of Senator Campion was a collaboration between Mr. O'Grady and Mr. Chapman um, working with our teams to sort of think about what it could look like if you wanted to move this forward. So I just want to clarify, there's often, we're, we're a little vague sometimes as to where proposals come from. And I just wanted to be clear that we're, this was, this is not officially a and and VDH's proposal. It's what we think could work and in response to a request that was made. So to my knowledge and, and Senator Campion, I would appreciate you to correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe your committee had seen this language prior to today, um, but this is- I don't, Yeah, it's a good question. I don't think we did. We had conversations about PCBs uh, you know, earlier this, this session, but I don't think the language was shared. So this is obviously the education world has had a number of challenges this spring and, and you all have been very busy. So I'm not shocked to hear it. Um, this was when um, I received some outreach from Senator Campion and Senator Baruth um, from the Appropriations Committee asking sort of um, how we might be able to, to move this forward if the desire was to make it a, a, a mandatory testing program. And so looking back on the language that had been developed, I thought this was the sort of the most prudent path forward that addresses the various needs. That's not to say that this, that this language addresses two of the primary concerns um, that you will hear likely hear from your next witnesses from the education community is in that while this sets up the structure for how the sort of follow on from the testing will occur, it does not allocate any resources there. We anticipate that that $4.5 million will likely be spent on testing only. Um, and that is just the initial testing. That is not the deeper 
dive testing into where, into the actual investigation at a specific location. Um, and so the other, there are a couple of variables that we don't fully, um, that we, we just, we, we don't know yet. The first is the number of schools that may meet the criteria that Mr. O'Grady laid out. Um, the, the knowledge about the state of school buildings overall is, 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 is not perfect, right? And so we would need to start with a survey to school districts to better understand what buildings might qualify and then move into the, into the testing phase. Um, the other variable is that while the Burlington High School situation is receiving a ton of uh, attention, it is also a relative outlier in terms of potential cost. Uh, or we, we hope it will be an outlier in terms of potential cost. Um, and so there will be a range of potential remediation costs um, running from a sort of low end of 50,000 per school somewhere in there up to um, what could occur in the future, you know, with the Burlington High School example. And so um, Trish and her team put together some thoughts based on their conversations with BDH and with uh, the, the recognized expert in the field at um, EPA region, New England region, about sort of what um, likely costs might be and sort of best guess might be about three, six million dollars in remediation costs. And that is, that's, that's the middle of a potentially very large sort of range of costs. Um, and so those, I just, I want to be clear up front that that's, that's the piece in here that's missing. And I think the one of the benefits to the work that you did previously on, on the lead in schools and the effort that was taken to both address wanting to lower the standard and make sure the testing was required was the provision of resources that, that accompanied that. Um, and I just, it, the $4.5 million feels like a lot, uh, but we anticipate testing in each school will cost roughly 15 to $20,000 and that there are probably about 150 schools somewhere in that realm that would qualify under the criteria. So that's, that's where we get to that uh, $4.5 million figure. So it is, there is a lot in front of us and a lot of unknown, um, but certainly want to make sure that the committee and is going in with eyes wide open to the, the challenges that we face. Um, and with that, um, I'm happy to have Matt or Trish uh, add anything at this point, but I think it might be most useful to get into your questions um, if if that pleases the committee. Yeah, uh, I think addressing uh, questions at this point would be would be great. And if we could start with the two things that jumped to mind: the the date, and then I'm trying to understand a little bit around how. Uh, how testing is done. In other words, we just, as you know, in the House has concurred with a mandatory test on radon. So we've been in the thick of how radon testing happens. This I suspect is very, very different, um, much more complicated. And uh, I would like to know how long it would take to actually get to all of these schools. So with that, I'll turn the floor back I to think, you. I think the, the, if I would get into the second question first, I think that might help frame up the first question. So maybe Trish, if you could walk through uh, what what indoor air quality testing for PCBs would look like in schools based on our previous experience and knowledge. More complicated and uh, Jeff, if you could mute, that'd be great. There we go. Thank you. The indoor air testing that, I'm um, sorry, Trish Coplino with the sites management section um, the indoor air sampling that normally happens is we have a consultant um, would put together a work plan for us to, to show where they're going to sample and the type of media they're going to sample. There's different analytical methods that um, can be used. We've prescribed one that we think will be the best in order to achieve the standard that we've set. The um, sampling media and pump would be deployed in the school. They would run for 24 hours. Then the consultant would need to go back and collect the sample uh, media and return that to the lab for sampling or for analysis. 
um, the consultants that we spoke with have suggested that um, they do like to go in and check on the pump halfway through just to make sure it's still operating the way it's supposed to. So there is consulting time added into the overall cost that we've looked at, but it's it's a 24 hour sample collection in multiple rooms without, throughout the school. And Trish, okay. maybe so if, I, if I may, could you say something about, uh, so these aren't things, you know, again, with lead, we had local officials do it with radon. There are about 20 consultants in the state, companies that have consultants that can come in and do this uh, certified work. Who does it with radon? Who does it with PCBs? Who are we looking to? Are there local companies? Is this something where we'd have groups coming from out of state? Just availability kinds of questions. Right. There there are um, multiple consultants in the state of Vermont that we've worked on worked with this on. So there are plenty of consultants that have done this. Um, we had discussed doing um, an outreach and education to any consultants that would be doing this work to make sure that they're doing it um, in accordance with our standards and with EPA standards and make sure that they're all comfortable with the, the requirements that we're looking for. But there are consultants in Vermont that have definitely done this type of sampling for us in the past. And if we were under, an, I mean, in, in some ways, uh, I mean, we are in an emergency situation. If we had said, you know, how many schools could we get tested? Um, and how quickly could we get these schools tested? How long would that take? Um, that's a good question that we've been struggling with only for capacity purposes. So. If we have um, one or two people that we can dedicate to do this, um, we can have them working on helping schools maybe 10 a week. I mean, it's it's a lot of work for us to start out with because we do go out and do the surveys with the schools and help them understand what the process is. We're planning on contracting with the consultants and having them do the work on the school's behalf. So there is a lot of oversight and review of work plans and documentation that will come into us before the work happens. Um, and so that's the time frame is set out that way so that we can actually accomplish the work um, with the staffing that we have now and making sure that we're helping the schools um, get through the process the right way. And the consulting community is it's not huge up here. So sure, sure. but 10 that. a week is 500 plus a year, we're looking at about 150. We have a deadline of 2026. It sounds like we could we could certainly move that deadline up. Uh, it's 10 a week that we might be able to look at the work plans. Right. And then, then the work comes back to us. We review the work. We work with the school on what we're finding, what the potential issues are, helping them to understand what the outcome is based on that. And so then being able to do 10 new ones on top of the 10 old ones that are continuing, that's not really realistic. For no, I understand. And, and again, we're not looking to test 500, we're just 150. Send reliance, please. So as you're, as you're talking, um, the deep dive to really evaluate each school is not part of this first assessment that you're talking about? Correct. It's yeah, so that your right. initial analysis is is simply that. And so you're then how, obviously records need to be kept. And then what happens with the, when the, when the deep dive takes place and what's the timing on that? I just want to get a full picture. So that, that let me jump in and a little bit here. That's where the, the complications really come in because once we have data that suggests that there's an issue in a school, we will also need to begin the process of doing that investigation, which will rely on the same people, right? And so there is a, we can generate a bunch of data in fairly short order if that's what we were all we were trying to do, but we're also trying to make sure that we can get to solutions at the same time. So that's, that's part of the complicating factor of all of this. Um, is, the, um, is the need to proceed quickly with the deep dive uh, part of the rules that you work with, or is it a federal requirement? What is the, is it 
simply a, a moral obligation? What what is what is promoting the quick turnaround when you identify PCBs at the level? Well, I think it starts with a moral imperative. Well, uh, yeah, I, I was hoping. <laughs> um, and then the rule establishes clear timelines for okay. how that process goes forward. Um, so, so it's a state it's a state driven rule. There's nothing within uh, any federal guidelines that are or are there that say once you identify the PCBs, you must proceed. There are also federal guidelines at certain levels, and I'll have Trish speak to that. Okay. So EPA's guidelines, um, as as I understand them, are not very clear as to um, indoor air issues. They would basically say that once you identify that there's an indoor air impact, that you need to determine what the source of that impact is coming from. And once you've identified that source and it's greater than a certain concentration, then it's um, unpermitted and it's not allowed to be in that location anymore. And so EPA would require them to take it out and, and address it, which is what's happening in Burlington right now. So, so there are requirements to report. They're not clear timeframe uh, requirements that I've seen within the regulations for EPA. Um, but they tie back to concentration and building materials. Interlines, uh, yeah, please go ahead. This is it's not related to the testing of the process necessarily, but any, do you have any insight into what, uh, I know there's a big debate going on around infrastructure right now and the, at the federal level, but is there any indication that uh, school infrastructure needs or this type of remediation will be addressed. Do you have any insight into that? Maybe uh, Michael I, or Matt or somebody, I don't know. Commissioner. So, uh, Senator Lyons, I think at this point, we're all waiting to see yeah. what that, uh, what the American Jobs Act specifics look like and what makes it through Congress. There is, uh, I have not seen anything to indicate anything that would specifically speak to indoor air quality or contaminants in schools specifically, but um, brownfields often tend to be fairly popular pieces. And if we could expand some of that language to be more about um, you know, cleanup of, of known contamination, then there's some possibility there, uh, but that we're a, we're a long way from, from knowing, we're well, not a long way, um, but we're months away from knowing what that might look like. Yep, thank you. So I'm in contact a little bit here with the probes, uh, waiting to hear back. Uh, so we make our way through this amendment and timing. One of the questions I have is, and this really, I don't think this is a question for anyone here, but we can always hear from folks, but if you're a third grader, second grader, and we're saying, you know, you could be in a school for five years, possibly, or, or whatever the, you know, let's say we, we say one year, but let, right now as it's written 2026, you know, it sounds, based on the conversations on, around radon, we are putting the health, of course, of children and faculty and staff in jeopardy. And, and to me, it goes back to the if I were a parent, you know, knowledge is power and knowledge allows me if there are is, is PCBs in a child's school, I think uh, parents are likely to not be concerned with this cost that it's going to cost the school to fix the problem. I think they're going to say, you're out, you're coming home, we're changing something, we're, we're making a huge change. And I get that. I completely, not being a parent, but I completely get that. So. For me, getting those numbers and getting families to understand and giving them the op, you know, so that they know their options uh, is, is first and foremost uh, in my mind. And I think probably for everybody here as well. So um, I think that goes, goes back to my previous statement about that this isn't, this isn't necessarily our proposal. This was a sort of starting point for a Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you need to hear from other other stakeholders certainly on the time frame associated with um, this process. Um, we 
we are constrained in terms of the pipeline, in terms of managing the work and want to be clear on that. But we certainly respect and feel that moral certain need to, 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 to get to work on the testing and provide information to, um, to, to parents. I appreciate that very much. And I uh, don't doubt it for a second. So to that end, Commissioner, uh, I'm wondering if we were to say we want to have everybody test to keep it in line with what we're doing with radar which is uh you know a little over a year out is that something that uh if we came back and said this is you know let's let's get rolling this is would that work could it be six months could it be i mean what what is the how fast could it be done and if you don't know the answer please feel free to to tell me you know, could you have somebody else in to answer that? Yeah, I, 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 there are a number of unknowns that prevent me from being able to feel confident in that process. Okay. Maybe it's a distinction between having the, doing the testing and having completed all of the steps in the process by a, a certain date, if that makes sense. Um, because really the testing mm -hmm. is, is the first step along the way if we think about sort of a coarser or finer and finer filter uh, to, so we have however many schools we have in the state now, we have some sense of how many might be, uh, be eligible for testing. We filter that, get to a smaller number, and then continue to filter down until we know which ones need to be remediated. Um, I, I, so I, I think, um, I think it's a challenging question to, for me to answer with confidence. Okay. Um, um, might we ask you to, to uh, come back to us? Uh, I mean, we're going to come back to you at some point and say, hey, we've come to this. So if you could come back to us, I think the other question for me, and, and I suspect uh, others, but from just the, what do parents need to know immediately? Again, I, where I'm sitting, it's, okay, tobacco's bad, like you know it, you're gonna make decisions. These things, like what is it, is that first round of testing, uh, and maybe this is something, uh, Patricia, I'm sorry, is your last name pronounced uh, Capolino? Or Ms. Capolino, if, if I just want all the parents in the state to know whether or not their children are being exposed to PCBs, what does that look like? I mean, I'm talking like just know that it's in the school and that it's at a dangerous level. Hey, please. If it's just collecting the samples, yes, we're assuming it's 120 schools, mm -hmm. then then that can happen probably within a year. That means we're not really responding to the results that are coming back and digging into everything and that we have consultants that can get all this work done and sample equipment and everything else. So there's a lot of caveats in that, okay. but if it's just, don't just deploying canisters, <laughs> looking yeah. at it, say positive, negative, and we're not going to actually address the issues that are associated with it, then, then that's, that's kind of, I think what Commissioner Locke was saying, we can provide uh, an analysis right. of what's there, but actually addressing the issue is a, sec is a separate question. I understand that, but they could also be done. You could, for example, notify me that, you know, the PCB level is X, Y, Z at my child's school while also continuing the work that you're doing. We could, um, but I would just throw out there that once we notify a school, we're usually inundated with phone calls and questions yeah. and requests to participate in public meetings and explain what the issue is and what's happening to my child. And so sure. in school, like Burlington takes up a real lot of, of my time and my staff's time. So it, it's not that simple. I understand, but that is, uh, I have to say that that's very helpful. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's, you know, what we're trying to convey is that the, the data that if it were just the collection of the data as a first step, yeah, and that, that we could then set, you know, set that aside as a discrete task, and then get to the investigation, the remediation, that year long timeframe is workable. 
it is the challenge that none of the that they're all of those steps overlap with each other because there is as soon as there is data out a desire and a sense of urgency from the community to address it and that's when that's when the the, the challenging and, and and detailed work begins and we want to be able to respond to that in a meaningful way quickly and, and I completely agree and respect uh, that. And I know I don't need to say this to anybody on this because as I look at the screen, most of the people I'm looking at have children, uh, so uh, if not all. So I just want to sort of step back from the policy thing, you know, policymakers here and just think, okay, as a parent, you're sitting watching this, what do you need to know, again, is sort of, you know, and how do we get that information to them uh, so that they can be, empowered to protect their children uh, from harm. That's what I'm asking myself. And I, and I know you all are, you know, as well. Um, Commissioner. I would, I would just add that I, I do fear a, an equity challenge here as well that okay. those with the resources to pull their children out of school yeah. will do so. And those without them will not. And if we are waiting to do investigation or remediation to get through the testing component, then we're going to run into issues of equity. And, I, and so that's part of the piece that, 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 that weighs on my mind as we think about the timeline and how we do this work. I appreciate that thoughtfulness and sensitivity to that. I really do. And uh, I'm glad you raised it because if we were to move in this direction, then we as po that's where we as policymakers have to make sure that uh, we do address that equity piece. Um, and it is just, it's not just you know, the families that can afford to do it can pull out their children, but that all children would be, you know, uh, afforded that same opportunity, uh, whatever that might look like, quickly putting, you know, little schools together, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Committee, uh, questions at this time, um, looking around, uh, Senator Terenzini, please. Well, I was just going to suggest, uh, you know, I'm getting the horse before the cart here but you know we've gotten pretty good over the last year of doing virtual school so if it had to come to the point where as you just suggested center camp you, you know we'd have to figure out something quickly to do whether it be little schools or whatever you know we have the technology now to to keep our kids home and safe and do uh virtual schools um and uh certainly this information, I mean, I've been shaking my head for the last 15 minutes up and down so much it hurts with you talking and I agree with you on everything. Uh, this information, we need to do the testing, we need to get the information out there. It's, it's critically important and it's a moral obligation of this committee and the Health and Welfare Committee and the Senate in general to, to do this, I think, so. Thank you, Senator Terenzini. Other uh, questions or comments from committee at this point? I see we also have, uh, Mr. Chapman, you're here. Uh, I don't know if there's something that you would like to say. You know, we've heard from your two colleagues. If there's new information that they haven't covered. No, in fact, I was here to just answer any questions about the language. I mean, Mr. O'Grady did a great job walking through it, and I frankly don't have anything to add to Mike's overview. Okay. Senator Hooker, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, at the beginning of the conversation, Mr. O'Grady mentioned a voluntary program. How does that figure in here? I don't see any language about, um, you know, who's involved, who, how these schools get involved, who's responsible for the outreach, any of that that we talked about at the beginning. That's a great question, Senator Hooker. We, so when, when we proposed this language to be in the budget. It was set up with the idea that we would stand up that voluntary program once the money was available and we could contract for uh, our, our uh, consultants to be able to do that work and to be able to make it available to it. There is the opportunity for schools to test now and there have been several that have been interested and have reached out to, to Trish and colleagues at the D Department of Health to understand what's needed to be able to test. Um, and so there have been schools that have chosen to, to move forward in that way, but we would like to make resources available to them to help with that process. And so that was really the idea, but we always knew it was gonna be a placeholder because of the interest around the topic and wanting to, to, to think about a, a different way to approach the challenge. 
Senator Lyons. So <clears throat> the schools that you've talked with that are going forward, you, you are working closely with them. Are you recommending the consultant that they work with and then keeping an eye on the outcomes? Is there a mandatory reporting for PCBs once it's tested? Trish, I think that's probably right, right up your alley. <laughs> um, we have been contacted by several consultants that have been contacted by schools that want to hire them to do indoor air sampling. And the consultants have been asking them to hold off because we have some guidance documents that we're, we're, we'd like to share, but we haven't made public yet that go through the sampling requirements and what to look at inside the school. Um, they are not required to share that information with us if they collect um, the, the PCBs um, in indoor air and they get positive results. The consultant's not required, but is the school required? No. Neither one? No. Well, and I, I, so I was just going to add on this one. I think that's one of the important things about the changes that are being proposed to the definition of release. That change brings it in to ANR's existing <laughs> regulatory structure. And then at that point, there is an obligation to report if you know that a release has taken place. So that sort of this, this would sort of close that hole. So the fact that you're writing guidance and providing guidance to these folks is great. I mean, that's, that's the right thing to do, but it doesn't then require, they, they don't have to get information back to you. Okay. Correct. But that's, that's the situation as it stands now and not sure. one that we anticipate continuing because I would you're say right. one, one way or another, <laughs> Either this, yeah, this, or some other language will move forward. But the the language as it stands now in the budget will enable us to contract with the resources to to manage that process. And when we contract with those resources, they work for us uh, in partnership with the schools. Um, and so we would receive that data. Okay. Um, that so, Mr. Chair, is it okay if I ask a couple more please, questions? Please, please. But, so. Um, I have two questions and I just forgot the first one, uh, but that's okay. Um, the second one was once we start looking at schools that are part of our public system, does this in any way implicate or cause us to consider, and I remembered my first one, so I'm writing it down, um, to consider, um, such entities as child care centers or uh, publicly uh, public buildings for state employees um, and so on and so forth. I mean, it does, uh, schools I think are absolutely critical and I'm not suggesting that we divert our attention from that, but then I'm, I'm wondering if there's been any discussion with about um, other organizations that are publicly funded or state buildings? Nobody wants to answer that, but you don't have to answer that. No, it's Senator Lyons, that's a, great, that's a great question. And I'll start and, and Trish can, <laughs> can back clean up. The, um, y yes, there are, okay. there are PCB, there were PCBs in use in building products uh, for a long period of time. Uh, they are, we, you know, and Trish, I might ask you to go through the details, but in our large municipal buildings and other things of that nature, they are, that were built or renovated in the same time frame are likely to be present. Um, but it, it, the, the specific child thought on childcare facilities, I think Trish, you had some detail there that might be helpful. Um, we have actually started talking with the Department of Children, DCF, just to see what they have um, for facilities that were built before 1980. So I do have that information already. Um, and I have kind of poked BGS a little just to think about that issue related to state buildings. Um, but it's just been discussion since there aren't really 
regulations around it right now. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, so it would seem to me child care facilities in particular might be the next, the next, if not part of the first step. So just a thought the and it does cost money to do that. We get that. But then that also flows back to how one might use ARPA funds. We know that some ARPA funds are going directly to child care centers, the stabilization funds. And we know that other funds are uh, have flexibility at the state level. So that's a bigger discussion that starts to flow out of this committee, but it I think is really related. Mr. O'Grady, you had your hand up. I, I was just gonna say that if you add child cares and it, it significantly changes the fiscal right. uh, requirements because there's approximately there's approximately a thousand buildings that we, you would need to add, um, assuming that they were, you know, built or renovated prior to 1980. Okay. So I, I, I guess I would just add that for purposes of clarity, if you look at the changes again to the definition of release under both, it's not limited to schools. Um, it's, in, it's expansive to any building or structure, um, and that was intentional. Um, we've identified the same sort of issues, Senator Lyons, that, that you've pointed out, and, and not going to draw a distinction at, at who's occupying the building. Thank you. Um, then my last, I hope, my last yeah. question is, uh, just trying to get the full picture here, but uh, the rules that you have that guide a uh, procedures for the deeper dive and then responsibilities. Um, how d sort of in turn, not in terms of uh, intensity uh, and, and regulation, how do those rules compare with the uh, process? Because uh, uh, Michael Grady brought up the lead procedures that were quite tight and I'm wondering if the rules that you have with respect to PCBs are equally uh, tight. So I guess my question is, what does tight mean? Well, I think a, a very um, prescriptive. And um, I guess that would probably be the way. Michael, I'm looking to you for your definition. <laughs> well, what was in the lead testing bill was first the the deadline mm -hmm. then there was a process mm -hmm. uh, then there was uh um, requirements for if for posting the testing results um, and then there was a requirement for response um, if it exceeded the exceedance level um, you have some of that in the language that's provided by a and r but not all of it okay. um and so that's that's you could use some of what was in the lead bill but as i stated earlier you're talking about a different contaminant with a different source with not as uh, generally as um addressable issue as the plumbing fixtures for lead and, and drinking water right so that, that's a complicating factor um, and isn't, is something that I think the rule is supposed to address, the you know, contaminated well, properties rule. Matt, let, me, let me start quickly. I think uh, that- uh, Commissioner, uh, Senator Lyons, did you want to respond to that? No, this is helpful. And I'm, okay. I'd really like to hear what the commissioner and Matt have yep, to say. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Um, the 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 IROC rule is is a uh, is a, a tested and strong rule to get to lead to cleanups. Um, I think there are a number of factors <laughs> that 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 lend itself well to that process because it is you know an investigative process to understand the full extent and the scope of the contamination and then getting into remedial options because it is not a sort of simple. Uh, you know, the lead process was relatively simple as Mr. O'Grady laid out. The presence of contamination was likely caused by 
you know, a, a, a fixture that, that had, you know, existing lead in it, it could be swapped out and the problem was solved. That's not going to occur uh, likely in this scenario. And so that's where this rule comes into play and, and is, is well suited to it where we deal with contaminated sites around the, around the state. Uh, Matt, if you want to add to that, I'm happy to. Yeah, I, I was actually going to say almost the same thing. I guess the, the rule is very detailed and it's very detailed from a, from a process perspective on what people do to sort of investigate, look at what the alternatives are, and then come up with a solution that's health protective, environmentally protective. But it's not like the lead process where that was very directive, right? This is a much more flexible process where you look basically at the data and the science that comes in and make decisions based on that. Is there a timeline in the rule? For remediation, there is though there does there is some flexibility for the the secretary to basically look at what the problem is and make adjustments to that timeline based on on sort of the complexity of either the engineering or site specific characteristics. So, so can I? I'm I'm Please. sorry. One last question, and then I'll stop. But, but when you look at the Burlington High School situation where the testing took place and then obviously the deep dive took place and then how was it that the decision was reached? I mean, did you follow the rule, the rules throughout um, to reach the decision for school closure? Can you just talk about that a little bit? And I don't, it doesn't have to be prolonged, but I think it's, it's what is driving a lot of what's going on. Well, I think there's an apples to oranges comparison being yeah. made here um, because at, currently ANR does not have jurisdiction over indoor air releases. So the process that is, so the, the Burlington process is, involves a number of factors. We've primarily been involved in their renovation programs because of the presence of PCBs in soils around the site. Um, the issue, the decision to close and to, to ultimately abandon the remodel were not made under our rule because we don't have jurisdiction, right? The, that was not a, we didn't force that to occur, I guess is, is what I'm say, trying to say. Um, if, so this is, this is, and we, we try to get to, there are moments when, uh, you know, sites need to, you know, may need to be closed and fully remediated for some period of time before they can be brought back into reuse. But we try to get facilities cleaned up so that they can be brought back to productive use. Um, but that it's a, it's a, this current, the framework that we're talking about here is not what the Burling, Burlington has followed. Thank you. I'm wondering if uh, I'm looking at Mr. O'Grady, uh, Mr. Walk and his team. I, I think this committee, uh, and I know that appropriations we know also is under a tight schedule at this point. This is where this language would go. I'm wondering if uh, Mr. Walk, you'd be willing to work with uh, your team and Mr. O'Grady to, and we're not finished taking testimony, but w we think we're going to get somewhere. And that time frame is gonna be tighter and it's going to be, I suspect, uh, letting families know in whatever, in the best way possible. In other words, you know, if, if their children are in schools that and are being exposed to PCBs, it's, it's that kind of direction uh, that I'm hearing at this point. And we're going to continue to take testimony, but I'm, I'm looking to you to, to will you be willing to work with uh, Ledge Council to to again, maybe bring back some language as early as Monday for us to look at. Uh, we're happy to work with Ledge Council if that's the chair's desire. I think our what we would primarily do is look at the sort of feasibility of, of different timelines and provide you with the options and the associated risks associated with those timelines. Um, and the sort of resource constraints and needs. Um, I would also encourage you to hear about that from the, the school facilities as well. Right. As obviously, that's, that's a factor that we don't have uh, control or input. Great. Thank you. Uh, committee, I wanna shift. Uh, I'm hoping our witnesses can stay with us, but uh, 
we are going to shift to hear from uh, members of uh, that represent our various school constitu constituencies. Uh, so with that, uh, Mr. Fannin, from the NEA, uh, welcome back to Senate Ed. Uh, you've been following the topic that we're on uh, and uh, the floor is yours. All righty, thank you very much for the record, Jeff Fannin, Vermont NEA. Uh, it was actually good to hear from um, uh, the, the DEC folks and the commissioner and, and understand this a little bit better because it's out of my wheelhouse of normal. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit deeper in the weeds and uh, or over my head perhaps. But I, I think as a simple matter, um, Vermont EA supports testing schools for PCBs. I mean, we have people who have been affected negatively by the Burlington situation, not only in their um, uh, sort of just where they're teaching and how that, that's going and all the disruption that's caused, but people who had physical issues over the last several years and um, not knowing where it, it came from. And they would moderate over the summer, for example, and then they return in the fall. It's not bad until you start closing the, the windows when it gets cold. And so that would be a cycle that some people had. And so it's real, it's affected people. And, uh, you know, it, it's hard to pinpoint that it was PCBs, but once you get the, the information that we've gotten recently from the Burlington High School, it, it, it actually has helped. So getting the information out is a way to at least acknowledge that there are, perhaps are issues and that you're not, you know, that these rashes or other ailments that you have aren't made up. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's really important as we understand chemical reactions and everybody's different. Everybody, perhaps their immune systems are different, their bodies are different, and they will react differently to uh, various contaminants. So um, we think certainly you should test not only for the staff, but for the students. You've got young kids, who uh, young people who have developing immune systems, developing uh, systems overall, they're developing bodies, and we ought to be cognizant of that and the, and the role that chemicals and other contaminants play on that uh, maturation process. So that's, that's really important. Um, I think if I heard um, the, the earlier testimony there correctly, um, it looks like the 26 deadline is a bit far out. It seems like we can get there a bit quicker. And I think there, there is an imperative here to move sooner rather than later. This is not good stuff that we're talking about here. And I don't think anybody, and I'm not suggesting anybody disagrees. I think that how we get there is what we're discussing. I think everybody wants to get there. I think we all agree to that. Um, one thing I thought I heard was uh, that once you test and figure out there's modest level that exceeds a, a particular point, um, that then you wanna have a plan in place to follow up so that there's not a lot of uh, delay, if you will. And I understand that, um, but I also heard that each <clears throat> building would present a unique set of circumstances and factors that would go into the plan that you would develop. So it seems like um, it's great to have a, 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 an overall structure to a plan, but really what we're talking about is very specific, tailored uh, ways to look at and investigate further and then down the road remediate once the, the, the problem is identified. And that's very specific to a school. So having an overall structure in place is important, but what I think I heard is it's actually more important to have uh, the information quickly and then act upon it relatively quickly thereafter because each one is different and unique to that particular building. So I don't know how we, it's sort of both concepts. We want some overarching structure to the, to the, to the testing and then results when, when, once they are found and known. But then we also need to shift at the same time into a very specific school specific or building specific uh, way to, to investigate further and then possibly remediate. So it, it seems I'm trying to square the two and I'm not sure I'm the best one to do that, but that seems to be two conflicting uh, perhaps uh, points of, of discussion going forward. But I think that's uh, it, we can get there. I think certainly getting the information is, is a priority. Um, I also agree with the commissioner vis-a-vis -vis equity, and I think that, um, but I, I take it in a different, and take it in a different direction slightly. I think the schools and parents who um, have means will force their schools and their school communities, if you will, to test 
for PCBs. And the schools that don't have means uh, won't do that unless and until they're forced to do so by the state. And I think that's, that's actually a larger equity question. Um, and so I think that we as a state have an obligation to make sure that all schools, whether um, people are, are, have the ability or the means to do it, demand testing, we, that's the role of the state here to step in and say, hey, this stuff, this P, these PCBs are not good. We don't want kids, we don't staff uh, in, you know, being exposed to this contaminant. And we as a state think it's a priority to, to at least investigate, see where the test results are, and then uh, begin to dig further and remediate. So I think that is an equity issue, certainly, most definitely, but it, it's an equity issue I think that will go the other way. Uh, which is to say the state should be leading the charge here. And I think that's the right approach. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I don't, uh, I am not a chemical or environmental law expert by any stretch. No, thank you. Uh, questions for Mr. Fannin. Okay, the only other, the, the only comment I think uh, I have, and it's more to those that we, uh, we just heard from, and that's, you know, as, Mr. Walk and others are working on, you know, this, some of our options, um, knowing that, you know, to quote the, the, I think it was the Vermont digger that said, you know, this could just be the tip of the iceberg, you know, to really think uh, with colleagues and the administration to know, you know, to come back and say, okay, we may need, in order to do this work, we really may need these additional dollars, this many people, that kind of sort of all hands on deck. So thank you, Mr. Fannin, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, yep. Uh, Ms. Zaglowski, Vermont School Boards Association. Welcome back to Senate Ed. Thank you very much, Chair Campion. Great to see you. Thank you for the opportunity to give input on this very important and very serious issue. I hope I um, am not too just disjointed because um, some of the information is um, brand new to me today as it is to all of the rest of you. So I'm trying to um, uh, process it. Sure. I did notice that the appropriation for testing is split into two places in the Senate's version of H-436 and it's in one place in the House version. Not sure about the reason for that difference, but um, it was informative to me to hear the testimony um, of, I believe it was the commissioner who said that that um, appropriation of 4.5 million um, only covers the initial testing. And currently there's no um, appropriation or plan for investigation and remediation if testing reveals the presence of PCBs that are um, above the state screening standard. So um, as has been, um, discussed by other others this afternoon, um, there definitely is a need for some type of orderly, planful approach to the investigation and remediation um, issues when testing reveals that the presence um, of PCBs is above the state screening standard. Um, it seems like Commissioner Walk's submission that's on your website is heading in that direction with um, with the proposal that was submitted today, as I um, indicated, seeing that for the first time today. Um, I think as your as the discussion so far um, shows, it is an extremely complex issue. Uh, the, the document submitted by um, ANR requires site investigation and source identification for any result exceeding the state standard um, in accordance with um, ANR's investigation and remediation of contaminated properties rule. And I did take a, a look at that rule briefly and just would note that it, with its appendices, it's over 50 pages long. So um, need a little more time to try to digest that. Um, I did have a concern that it um, putting, putting it in this um, regulatory structure may possibly subject school districts to penalties. So I like some um, clarity about that. And um, I think overall the submission um, by Commissioner Walk illustrates the high level of complexity to this issue. I appreciate his um, reference to equity 
and also um, Jeff Fannin's re reference to equity. And think that it's extremely important to take the time that's needed to give this process the detailed thinking it deserves on the technical details and also on the equity issue so that the issue of PCBs in schools is addressed. Um, so with that, I would just ask um, to be included in um, any additional conversations, whether they're happening you know, it, during the um, what's left of this um, session or in some type of um, work group that would maybe work over the summer. Um, thank you very much for um, inviting me today. Thank you. So um, just uh, to clarify, because we're looking at requiring testing in schools, uh, perhaps as soon as during this next year, are, are you in support of that? I think it 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 needs to be there need to be a lot of more details added um, it, about the investigation and the remediation and and also um, an appropriation added for investigation and remediation um, to, in order to make this um, a complete plan. So n no, not at this point. Is that accurate? I would need more details in order to really answer your question. Okay, so we're looking at this just for our witnesses who may have come in before Mr. Fannin, or after Mr. Fannin. We're trying to take a step back. You know, your parents, your your you have children in schools. This is information we're moving toward. Like we we need we want to get this information to parents. You're overseeing the school board association. I'm wondering if you believe. And I don't think, I'm trying not to complicate it. Should parents have this information if their children are going to a school or if teachers are in schools teaching as soon as possible within this year? They should have this information okay. as soon as possible. Yes. Right. Um, but it, but we have to think about what happens after they have the information. Absolutely. Um, I'm thinking right now, though, if they don't have the information, and if they were to uh, become ill, get cancer, child gets harmed, that, that's sort of where we're at right now. But I agree, we do need to take that next step um, around what happens once that information is had. Questions for Ms. Zaglowski? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Francis, uh, Superintendent's Association, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Jeffrey Francis from the Superintendents Association. How is my audio function? Perfect. No. Okay. Thank you very much. So, um, first of all, I want to express my appreciation to the committee and also the witnesses that preceded me. I've I've learned a lot about um, the approach that the state is contemplating, uh, just as a result of what I've heard today. Um, three things occurred to me in the testimony. The first is that um, the General Assembly appropriately is focusing on the what, which as uh, Senator Campion just articulated is a desire to get reliable information out to parents in a timely way, which I think is um, very, very useful and appropriate. Those of us that are serving the school communities um, are compelled to deal with the how. Um, and that's what I've tried to wrap my brain around this afternoon. There's two things that, um, that I'm regretting. One is that I took note of uh, Commissioner Walk's submission and saw that the date on it was February. And I frankly wish that the conversation that we're having today had started then. And secondly, um, I'm wondering, and I'm sure that uh, you've got Secretary French scheduled on this topic, but as the person who's responsible for overseeing the operation of Vermont's public schools, I think it'll be really important to hear from him. Um, because what I've heard so far, and again, I do appreciate the, the everything, all the work that's gone into this to this point, was at first I, I thought we were gonna deal with a regulatory approach and then it sort of progressed into a programmatic approach from the state's perspective in terms of testing and so on and so forth. 
what I'm interested in and what the superintendents with whom I work with will be interested in and what the facilities people with whom I work with will be interested in um, are the logistics, the financing, and the education delivery in the context. And I don't want anyone to interpret anything I'm saying as not being cooperative toward the purpose that Senator Campion articulated and also contending with what I think is gonna be an extraordinarily challenging um, project. I think that, and other witnesses have alluded to this, that uh, PCBs will make lead and radon look very simple in terms of what we're doing. And the reason is when tests are occurred and PCBs are identified, there's gonna be, and, and other witnesses have indicated this, there's gonna be um, a pretty profound reaction from community to community in places where PCBs are identified. So when I talk about logistics, and Senator Taranzini alluded to this earlier himself, he said, are, are we not adept at um, uh, remote learning? Um, but you're gonna, I mean, if you consider Burlington as an extreme case, and I think it is a useful case, and back away from that, there's gonna be all kinds of operational considerations um, that are going to have to be contended with around questions like how will we educate kids if you get into serious remediation projects for PCBs? And I think we should anticipate that. Um, how will you do that in an equitable way? And ultimately, how are you going to provide funding support for um, districts that have to engage in that remediation? So I'm not saying that uh, in terms of discouragement or um, defiance or lack of cooperation. I'm just telling you based on my experience and observation what I think ultimately you'll be getting into. So in my mind, the challenge for the General Assembly, and I'm gonna take a liberty here, would be if you're intending to move on this bill in the next week, you wanna get the ball started on testing but you do not want to forego any of those other considerations that I've offered, because in the absence of a plan for logistical details, funding details, and educational details, you're gonna be basically picking up pieces while you're dealing with PCBs. And, you know, um, I think I have a reputation for speaking relatively straightforwardly, and that's what I'm trying to do here, I think that when you hear from Secretary French, um, he can bring more information in with regard to logistics alone. I'll leave this way. Everybody on this um, call has familiarity with a school or a set of schools. Um, what I've been uh, engaged in over the course of my career is trying to understand all schools and you know what you're gonna encounter in Springfield, for example, if. PCBs were identified there is quite different than the Burlington experience, which would be quite different than the Middlesex experience and so on and so forth. When we embark on this, and I am not discouraging you from moving forward, we have to be prepared for all of it. And that's right. what I think you need to be thinking about. And Thank I'm you. gonna stop there. Senator Terenzini. Uh, thanks, Senator Kimmy. And I, I appreciate your, your comments, Mr. Francis. I really do. I, uh, at the end of the day, though, I just can't wrap my head around the fact that uh, we've heard a lot of good testimony today. But uh, at the end of the day, we have thousands and thousands of kids, a couple of mine included, a couple of Senator Chittenden's and others. They're in these schools. And I think that uh, we would rather know sooner than later. I think that we can move quickly with plans. We are getting $2 billion from the federal government. And there's a lot of ideas of how to spend that $2 billion. A lot of it's already been spent. Uh, and one could argue, should some of it have been spent here versus there or whatever, that's for another day. But the fact of the matter is I, I'm all for moving forward at 100 miles an hour to, to, get, to get these uh, tests done and make sure these kids are healthy. And uh, you know, I think 
whether it be, and I'm a brand new senator, whether it be more time is spent on this over the summer in a study committee, if that's permitted, or however it's done, but we need to figure out how to test these schools, keep the kids and faculty safe, uh, and ensure that um, this isn't a problem going forward. I came from an elementary school, and Senator Hooker might remember, but I came from an elementary school when I was there in the early 90s uh, that we had six or seven teachers within a year uh, were diagnosed with different types of cancer. And our parents were scared to death to send their kids to school. Kids were taken out of Rutland Town School. Uh, teachers were sick. I mean, it was a terrible time in the mid 90s uh, when you think about what that our, our municipality went through. It was never found to be, they never found the cause. And they, you know, it was, it could have been totally coincidental that five or six or seven teachers all had cancer at the same time, but very suspicious. Uh, and um, anyways, the, I'm, I'm delaying here, but I think it needs to be done. And I'm really passionate about this center at Campion that we figure out a, a, a path forward. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So Senator Francis, or Secretary, Mr. Francis. Yes. Uh, all of the above. Uh, so I'm going to ask the same question of you that I asked of Sue Siglowski, just to be fair. For clarification, you support testing immediately. Uh, get this information to parents while at the same time we would, you know, the, the, perhaps it's the uh, work with Senator Ballant who can, uh, in her authority as pro tem, can set out summer program studies or what have you to, to make sure that we're ready to address. But you are on board with this immediate testing so that parents can know. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So okay. yes, I'd like to respond to that. Sure. Before I, I want to make sure that Senator Please. Terenzini doesn't think that anything I said contradicted anything he said. So that's the first thing. Two, I, you know, this, this is the first day of testimony on an extraordinary complex issue. My response to you, Senator Campion, is I would suggest that you move forward with the, with, immediately with the voluntary testing program that was uh, originally envisioned by the administration, get that work underway, and then utilize the time between now and however long it takes to put the type of planning into place that I think is going to be required in order to have what I'm referring to as a comprehensive program that deals not only with testing and response to the testing, but also logistical planning, planning for remediation, and most significantly, making sure that through whatever follow-up actions are required, you can educate kids in the state equitably um, as you proceed. And I, I, I think that uh, that, um, that is an approach that could be successful if that's the approach that you decide to take. I don't think that it's a good idea to say, we're gonna test every school, produce the results, and then figure out the rest of the details later, including the money. I, I, I do not think that that is a prudent approach. And just for the record, I, I do think, and then Senator Chittenden, I think we're, this is, I don't think this is as complicated as everybody, some wanna make this. This is, do we let parents know? Do we let their families know? Do we teach, you know, teachers and staff know? Uh, Senator Chittenden. I'll say two things. One, I completely echo everything Senator Terenzini said. And the second thing is, uh, to Mr. Francis, I, I can get behind not a mandatory testing of every school, but I, I, I want to uh, revisit a concern that was raised when I joined. Um, I, I, I'm hesitant to support a voluntary approach because of the discrepancy and the, the importance of equity. And I would, could support a more intelligent targeting approach where if we have buildings that based on the construction, the era that they were built, uh, based on how, what we know about when they were built, that we would focus and, and strategize the testing and prioritize the testing. But I, I would, um, sitting in this vantage point in the, with the responsibility to provide equitable access to educational opportunities and safety standards, I'm hesitant to leave it to a voluntary approach to school districts. So, I, so uh, I want final, to ask Mr. Francis, final word, because we have a hard 3.30 stop and we have two more witnesses. Final word, you have money allocated. I think you could go to a comparative risk analysis, which is what Senator Chittenden just described. Um, we've heard witnesses from the um, Department of Environmental Conservation talk about surveying schools in order to make determinations about what target schools might be. Um, again, I'll close this way. I don't want anybody to misinterpret.
interpret what I'm saying because I am supportive of environmental safety in schools. I, you know, um, try to think through from start to finish all the details and how it works for the public education system and the children and families that it serves and the employees that work in it overall. And my firm belief is that you need a comprehensive program that um, asks questions and answers them before you just start. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Mr. Nichols, uh, appreciate you uh, sticking with us on this. Uh, I don't need to tee it up, you know where we're at. Good Thank afternoon. You. I might be the person who missed the most of the testimony on this because I've been in the board <laughs> meeting all day. So I'm gonna no. share my thoughts. I, I'll try not sure. to repeat anything. Oftentimes the usual suspects as you folks call us get together and talk about these things. We didn't sure. have the opportunity to do that uh, with this bill. So for the record, Jay Nichols, Executive Director of Vermont Principals Association. It's likely that our, our members probably spend more time in the building than anybody else. Our, our principals work full year. They don't work uh, part year, you know, like teachers do and other people, like along with custodians, they work full year, but they're in there a lot of nights and stuff too, a lot of weekends, summertime. So we put a lot of time in the buildings. Uh, I myself have nine grandchildren, really 8.75. Got one coming here in a few weeks. Congratulations. Uh, most of them are in school. So I fully understand the problem from that perspective as well. So that all said, you know, as we do with lead and radon, we take all this very seriously. We think that the safety of administrators, faculty and staff, and of course students is paramount. I wanna say I agree with Jeff Fannin's testimony and that we need to take this seriously. And that was also echoed by Ms. Lazowski and Mr. Francis. Um, and I don't wanna be negative, but I do wanna share a couple concerns. I, I question the timing a little bit of the PCB work in terms of this, the first I've heard about this as an issue, this legislative session has been the last couple of days. So maybe I've completely missed it. If I have, I apologize. I just wanna make sure that we don't run into something that's not well planned out. Uh, sometimes the most expedient path is to fire without aiming. I just wanna make sure we take a little bit of time to aim. And I think Senator Chittenden and uh, you, you tried to promote him to Senator Francis and Secretary Francis, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, Mr. Francis, I think they, they both hit on something there. It may need to be targeted to the places that we think have the most need first. Uh, so I think you have to, have to have a pretty thorough plan. You also have to make sure that we're gonna be able to provide kids with a free and appropriate public education. Uh, although I'm not an expert on PCBs, I do wonder about our state having a standard that is so much more stringent than the EPA standard which appears to be the standard used by the other 49 states. If I'm incorrect about that, I'd love to be corrected. I don't have a problem with a voluntary or even a mandatory testing program. But my real major point is that the major points are, if a school district ends up with a major PCB issue, like seems to be the case in Burlington High School, who pays for the mitigation? What is the funding source? Are we potentially looking at knocking down dozens of schools, dozens of school buildings? I had a board meeting today and I talked to 15 principals and at least six of them are in big schools that are thinking, oh my God, this could easily be us. Our buildings were built around the same time. I think so, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think it is that serious. I really yeah. do. And yeah. I think for me, it's, uh, as I've said, it's, again, if I were a parent, I, I'd, I'd want to know if I had a spouse in the school, if I, you know, working full time in any capacity, I, I'd want to know and then let people take that knowledge and uh, make their decisions as well as all of us start to make a plan to uh, you know, uh, you know, do exactly what you're talking about, whatever it is, raise a building, uh, mitigate. But to me, and this is where I, I struggle a little bit, I think is, and I'm not saying this is what you're saying, but a little bit of my takeaway from previous witnesses was, uh, do we, well, maybe, no, this is, I, I don't want to put on previous witnesses, but waiting while we get to that plan, when again, the, the impacts of PCBs are so serious on one's health, especially as we learned from the radon conversations, kids as they're developing, you know, their lungs, you know, their little, heart, you know, all these things uh, and all this, all these chemicals, which we have created these problems, say for radon, of course, it's, it's natural in the environment. Uh, but uh, it's, 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 I want parents to know, and maybe I'm speaking a little bit too much with my heart and not with my brain, but I want parents to know, I want them not to have to wait to get this information. And 
Uh, I know I have utmost confidence uh, in us as Vermonters that we will uh, really rise to the occasion to, to fix whatever is actually found. Senator Chittenden. Mr. Nichols, you're not mistaken. This is the first time I, and for this session, I recall really diving into PCBs, but it's top of mind for many in the state when our largest high school um, is now not gonna be reopened because of it. Uh, I, I would just, I would think what I'm hearing, and I, I missed a lot of this testimony too, Mr. Nichols, so I might be recovering ground already, already addressed, uh, but I think if we can uh, commit to testing and, and collecting this information while simultaneously developing a mitigation approach, uh, the kid, the school where my kids go uh, has asbestos tiles. It, it is known by all parents. It is also deemed safe as long as we don't disrupt it. So if we can accompany this, this, uh, this uh, preparation to test for all these things with clear guidance on how uh, it can be safe for kids to go there so that we're not reacting to uh, the results without having thought through how it can be um, uh, mitigation approaches to make people feel safe and have to not have to raise buildings on a dime. I, I fully support that path. And I think that's, I, mean, I got a little bit more I wanna share. I think that's part of my point, Senator, is that if we're going to do this, we need to be thoughtful about all aspects of it. We right. need to realize that we've got kids that are, so let's, one of the things was mentioned, you know, we did remote learning really well. Well, you know, we did do it really well comparatively, but we've got a ton of kids who cannot get on a line effectively. We've got teachers who can't get online effectively. And we lost a lot of kids during the, during this uh, remote learning. Every principal will tell you, especially in our more rural areas that they, they had kids that effectively dropped out and they had kids that were second, third, fourth graders that were left to home, home alone, trying to navigate uh, bad internet to be able to access their education. So I don't want to see us go back to that. I just want us to be thoughtful. If we got to close XYZ school for a month or a year, what are we going to do with those kids? That's all I'm saying. Yeah, fully sure. on board with the, with the mitigation strategy, fully on board with, we need to find out what's going on. Right. But let's be thinking about what we're going to do to support those kids during that time. You know, I'm deep. worried about, the last thing I'll say, and I, I, I'll, I'll shorten my testimony, I'm worried about Broadband, and I've spoken about this, and I've testified in many committees, uh, over, and I've writ, relis, written broadband statements, supported yeah. the approach Randy Brock tried to take. We've got a lot of kids that we're talking about four or five years before they have adequate broadband. So for them, remote learning does not work because they don't have access to it. And so that's not really going to be an option for a number of our kids. Thank you. Uh, Senator Terenzini. Yeah, thank you, Senator Kempion. I, I uh, think what Senator Chinnon said is proportional. I think it's a reasonable response. Look, at, we, we obviously have to have a plan after we test, right? Because um, if it comes back, you know, terrible in school A, well, the classrooms are going to be empty. Parents, most of the parents aren't going to send their kids to the school, right? So you have to have a plan. And I, too, like Senator Kempion, maybe I'm thinking a little bit emotionally with my heart because this is an issue that's I'm passionate about, especially with having kids in the school and being a former uh, former school board member and and uh, so on but you know it's it's one of those things that you can't you can't see taste smell or whatever it's like uh, you know if the building was slowly on fire we wouldn't let the kids sit in that building would we right. you know so you know I'll, I'll stop there but I, I appreciate the conversation I just I too wish that we had and I'm not blaming anybody but I wish we had had uh, time uh, weeks ago for this information to have started this conversation a little sooner because it's certainly something I'm pretty passionate about and we, you know, I could seriously make some headway with, I think. Yeah. Now, I think I actually in some ways think uh, we're still okay with timing, but I think we all agree it would always good to have more time, but I think we can probably accomplish uh, a first couple of steps on this. Uh, committee, we do need to shift uh, because we, uh, I'm afraid there is a meeting regarding S13 that I need to attend, uh, but I also wanna give everyone an opportunity to hear from Ms. Parker and Mr. Pearl. Anything uh, final, Mr. Walk, I'm looking to you. Mr. Nichols, thank you very much. Very much appreciate it. Uh, as you know, we'll, we'll be working with you on this. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, Commissioner, if you, again you've you've been listening, and I know you're not our ledge counsel, but I think you've been taking in the maybe the the direction that we're moving in, which again is knowledge is power. Get this out there as soon as we can to parents, while simultaneously, uh, and I'll talk to the pro tem about this, perhaps setting something up 
uh, for this summer so that we can get ready. In other words, we know the results, worst case scenario, it's going to be pretty bad out there. And we need to make sure that we continue to educate children. We need to continue to you know, make sure kids are safe, all of those kinds of things. Um, but I do think we can get there. It's going to take some time, energy, and money, but uh, I think it's a big top priority. So I, I, thank you, Senator. I would just add, I think the conversations you've heard today are, are reflective of the real challenges of the full gamut of this challenge. Uh, we as, as parents, uh, my sister is the Vermont Teacher of the Year from 2020. We all have you know, concerns about uh, the safety of our school environments. The, rea the, the, the functional reality of this situation is that if we go out and we do testing, and every community that has a test result that's above the standard is going to want immediate action. And that immediate action is not going to be satisfactory. It's gonna involve a lot of further investigation and investigation and work that if we as the state fail to think through effectively, we're gonna cause bigger, more challenging issues for our school communities than simply the provision of information. And so that's, that's what we're certainly supportive of. I think what you've heard as you know, potential options from, from folks today is to stand up the logistics of the program and on a, you know, whether it's on a voluntary basis or a timeline with some work to, to come in the future to allow us to stand up the infrastructure and get the program in place so people can uh, really do this work and do it thoughtfully and effectively. Um, there are a number of considerations that you could uh, take into account, and we're happy to think through some of those options um, and present them to you. But I, I do, I, you know, just to remind the committee and all the witnesses that this, the work that, that, that is listed under my name was simply a sharing back of a draft that was... Oh, nobody, written. and if anything, I mean, this was some confusion. I was under the impression that the language in the big bill took care of this. Uh, and uh, so it's for the record, this is not a reflection on Commissioner Walk whatsoever that it has a February date on it and in no way should be connected to him. If anybody uh, should have a double check or triple check, it should have been uh, yours truly with making certain that uh, the language in the big bill really did was mandatory. I, I still think in some ways it sent a mandatory message, but that's neither here nor there at this point. I still think we need clarification. I think we need to make clear to everybody what we're going to do. I think this committee is moving in the direction of mandating some kind of timeline, perhaps some kind of uh, comparison, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, comparative risk analysis. I'm not sure, but, but certainly moving forward with, the, with uh, a mandate, and then while that's going, working with the pro tem's office to again deal with really what's going to have to be all hands on deck. Because I'm not disagreeing that parents, once people find this out, uh, it's going to be a problem. But I, I don't want to. I'm sounding, feeling like we're sounding a little bit like I don't know a, a cigarette company circa 1950 when they find out they're going to stop smoking. So. Let's not put the, 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 you know, the label on. I'm saying put the label on. Literally let people know. And yes, we are going to respond, but we are, and, and we'll respond as we always do. We, we, I do believe that in partnership with this administration, we'll, we'll fix it. I mean, I, I, I really do. I, I, we have infrastructure dollars that are coming in. We have good partnerships with our federal delegation. I know... I, don't want to speak for the governor, but I'm sure the governor cares about this. Uh, I think we get there, but let's put the label on, let's let people know, and let's deal with it. Committee, anything final? I will wait to hear back from uh, Mr. Walk and others with a draft that kind of, again, gets us moving in that direction. Uh, Mr. Brady, if you would work with uh, the commissioner, that would be great. And then hopefully by sometime either over the weekend or Monday, we can, uh, again, just get something going. Senator Lyons, please. Uh, I was just going to say, I think we really do need to move forward. And um, 
having the release information there that gives the, that gives reports to ANR for me is critically important. But then moving forward, but as you said, Mr. Chair, with a study in place to look at the logistics and how we're going to the process, how to proceed. You know, maybe it's a there's some prioritization that could be suggested, and that's probably an ANR suggestion. Once uh, initial investigations take place, then prioritizing available funds. Uh, you know, for those that have the greatest um, exposure within their buildings. So, so if I may, Senator Lance, there aren't available funds, right? So it's not a prioritization exercise, it's an identification exercise. Well, I, I, when I say available funds, I'm implying that we need to find them. I mean, that would that's a number one step. So I don't know where they come from, but we are going to need to find them. And maybe it will be some unnamed source from the federal government. Okay, I'm going to need to end it there. Uh, thank you all. Uh, appreciate everybody's willingness. Mr. Grady, you have, uh, you're unmuted. Do you have a question? I just wanted to get a little bit more clarity about what you want in the draft, but I, I guess I can work with the commissioner and Matt Chapman and bring you back something that you can refine okay, next week. Okay, I appreciate that. And I'm happy to be in touch over the weekend or after we finish today. Thank you all. That's a terrific, important conversation. Uh, Mr. Prawl and Ms. Parker, thanks for being with us. Um, we are, uh, it was raised this morning when we were in this committee that uh, we still need a little more information on the small schools grant. Uh, we are, uh, as I didn't hear any questions from committee members or senators, I don't think on the floor today when uh, it passed second reading but we uh, are, are hoping to just get a little bit more information so that senators are comfortable uh, agreeing with uh, Committee of Finance. Uh, and if not, uh, I'm happy to, to share that as, as well. There's also the question which we uh, I worked on for Tuesday. Um, this is a funding issue that was raised uh, by the chair of finance yesterday. We're going to have um, uh, Chris Roop in, I believe, who is from your office on you know, on Tuesday to talk to us about what exactly you know this uh, uh, the the funds that are related to retirement and health care that are in the Ed Fund that sort of thing. Just so senators will have that information. We know it's not in our jurisdiction. That's the Appropriations Committee. But but um, back to sort of our theme of the day: information is power. So. Uh, Senator Lyons, you're unmuted. Do you want to have a question before we get started? No. Okay. Oh, With that, Mr. Paul and Ms. Parker, if you don't mind, just bring us back to the small schools grant, what uh, ways and means of uh, their goal. Our finance committee also passed this out on second reading today. Uh, give us a, just a little bit more information, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. So maybe I can start on Mark. Mark Prowl from the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, when, Act, when Act 46 passed, school districts that were receiving a small school grant were allowed to continue that grant um, indefinitely if they merged voluntarily. Those districts that did not merge voluntarily did not get that benefit. What this bill would do is extend that benefit that's available now to the districts that merged voluntarily under Act 46 to those districts that did not merge voluntarily. So it'll put them on the same a level playing field. The way it would work is we would look back to the small school grant that was made available in 2020, and that grant would be made a, a, a permanent grant for the districts that um, are currently having to apply for the small school grant every year. Um, the only way they would lose that grant is if they decided to actually close that school. That's the same provision that's in law, law right now for the districts that merged voluntarily. Um, we took a look um, at um, some historical information to try to get an idea of what this would cost. And it turns out that it's pretty much a wash. Some school districts would receive a slightly larger grant 
as a result of um, having a small, small, a smaller calculated small, small school grant in 22 compared to what they had in 20. And for some districts, it would be the other way around. But it looked like it was pretty much a, a wash. The advantage to the districts, the districts that actually would lose a little bit of money under this, um, the advantage to them is that this would become a permanent grant for them as opposed to an annual grant that they have to apply for each year. So I'm not sure if so, that answers my yeah. question. But Essentially, yeah. it would just add in a little bit more planning. You know, if they know exactly how much they're going to be receiving each year, then they can budget for that and plan more accordingly. So that's one other advantage. And, and because because small schools keep getting smaller, it's, you know, it, 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 it will enable them to hang on to some more money. So overall, the, the grant statewide, including both all the districts that are eligible for either a merger support grant or a small school grant, it's about $8 million out of the education fund annually. So it's not a huge program, but it's important to the districts that get it. Yes, yeah, Senator Chinden. So it's 8 million now, um, and that's $8 million, which is a big chunk of money. How has it been over the years? Has it, uh, do you have any type of longitudinal uh, perspective of, has it grown, shrunk, fluctuated? Does it ebb and flow with the sands of time? It's been, it's been getting a little bit smaller each year. I think and the only information I have in front of me is FY20 was 8.4 million, 21, 8.2. And for FY22, it's projected to be 8.1. So it's coming down a little bit, but that's also breaked a little bit because um, districts that merged voluntarily had it converted into a merger support grant. So they're keeping the same amount. They don't lose anymore. Follow up, Chair Campion. Please. So I, I might have missed something, and I know I wasn't here yesterday. Could could you help me understand why we started talking about this this morning and what the question is before us? Thank you. No, I appreciate that. So in the miscellaneous tax bill today, uh, one of the things that finance did was they uh, are restoring the small schools grant, and as Mr. Pulp uh, raised. And so what Senator Cummings asked us to do is to take a look at the language, make sure that we're comfortable with it. It's, um, for the record, I mean, I'm comfortable with restoring it. Uh, it's finances put some work into this. I think it makes sense on a lot of levels. And that's, that's where we're at. So we started looking at it yesterday. We came in this morning into committee and I think uh, we just needed a little more time and a little more discussion around it just to make sure everyone was comfortable. But you probably, I don't know, I, to be honest, I don't remember if you were on the floor today. Yes, of course you were on the floor today because of, uh, but Senator, at that point, Senator Cummings also took us through the process a little bit and uh, just looking to make sure that our, at least the majority of our committee is, is okay with re restoring this, so. One more follow-up? Please, absolutely, yeah, this is no, good. I feel like this came up in the context of S13. And uh, my question is, is because this would be on the table. If we readjust the weightings, that's gonna put into question these small school grants, this $8 million, if we're gonna be adjusting for the rurality of a school district and giving them more money. Is, is that a correct impression from these discussions with S13 and small school districts so far? I, I think you're thinking of the excess spending provision that's in S13. Um, this, is, this is part of, um, help me out Brianna here. This is part I, of uh, 436. I, I it is in S13 because one of the factors in the waiting study is looking at geography and small schools and how resources are distributed. So I think that it would be something that the, the report looks into and something that we would continue to study as a study group. Um, so it's a little preemptive to say exactly how that would work out until we actually really dive into it as a study group this summer. Um, so We'll probably know more in a year or so, so that helps it all. Last question, Chair Gannon. No, no, go for it. So is this $8 million part of the $50 million that's been thrown around in some emails today that of the $50 million more million we're putting on the Ed Fund? I, I'm, I'm struggling with why we're discussing this $8 million. Yeah, no, th this has been part of the Education Fund for, for years now. It's not part of the additional money that's coming into the Education Fund in the, uh, House, uh, in the Senate past budget. Yeah, there's no connection. I think some there, there might be out there that there might be a connect, but there's no connection to those two. And on Tuesday, we're going to understand better when we hear from uh, Chris Roop about the 50 million and the history of that and, and, and why it was put in all that kind of thing. Right. 
Okay. You know, this is not really a fiscal issue. It's more a policy question. Right, right. It's whether, whether you want to extend a benefit that's made, been made available to voluntarily merge districts to, to all districts. Right. Senator Hooker. Oh, um, thank you. What would possible uh, negative aspects of including this be? Um, I can't think of any really negative aspects of it, except that you know this this was provided as an incentive for districts to merge voluntarily, mm -hmm. and so now it's right, being right. available to those districts that were, were required to merge by the Board of Education. So one argument is that you know they they aren't entitled to the benefit because they didn't voluntarily merge. The other side of the argument is that well, whether you merge voluntarily or involuntarily, we're all merged now, and we ought to level the playing field. And these. So it, it's, schools are already getting these grants, would be getting these grants, would have to apply for them annually? Yes, they, they apply for them annually and, um, you know, and they may not qualify in future years or, um, you know, and this, this would make their the grant perm, uh, permanent as long as the school remained open. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anything else for either uh, Mr. Perot or uh... Ms. Parker, and does anyone have any concerns with me again talking to Senate Finance about uh, being okay with this? Okay, thank you all. Um, thank you both. Uh, committee, uh, I really appreciate it. I know that some of these issues uh, that we're dealing with uh, are hard. They're uh, in some ways easy, uh, it, but without a doubt, it's hard this time of year. Uh, so appreciate the time, appreciate uh, everybody uh, pushing forward with this and um, stay in touch on that. Senator Terenzini, please. Well, I just two things quick. I, first of all, you got my blood pressure up pretty good today, this afternoon. <laughs> and second of all, I wish, I wish you hadn't waited until the end of, uh, session to tell me about this no tie policy in committee. I mean, I just, <laughs> I can breathe now. I know, exactly. I know. Have a good weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for a great week. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah, thank you and take care. Thanks, you too. Uh, Jeannie, I have to go, I'm afraid.